Hello, welcome to the mini camp edition of Dolphins in Depth, the podcast produced to you from the Miami Herald. I am your host, Omar Kelly, and I am here to bring you Tuesday's recap of what happened during Dolphins' mandatory mini camp, which means everybody has to attend. Everybody is there, but not everybody works. Um, and I think that this is a new era of the offseason program for the Miami Dolphins, where a lot of the veterans, especially if they're in their 30s, are not participating in these practices. But surprisingly, I will tell you, Jalen Ramsey participated in all of the practice. Now, he hasn't been here for the OTA program, and neither has Kendall Fuller, the two starting cornerbacks. But they did a significant amount of work during these mandatory minicamps. Coincidentally, Nick Needham and Kater Kohu did not participate. Now, whether they were injury issues or because they'd had a lot of snaps during the OTA sessions, um, who knows? But Mike McDaniels is clearly on a how do I preserve my team for December and January run. Um, it's going to be interesting to see who continues to participate in these mini camps. But I got to tell you, Jalen Ramsey, who, as you know, did not participate in last, season's off se last year's offseason program. And he also did not participate heavily during last year's mandatory minicamp. He was there and he was a heavy snap participant. It was very interesting to see. Um, there was one play in particular where he dropped, I think it was Braylon Sanders in zone, allowed Braylon Sanders to catch a pass. But other than that, very quiet day. But part of the reason why Jalen Ramsey pretty much had a quiet day was because nobody upset for Jalen Waddle in the starting trio worked. Um, Tyreek Hill is not a participant right now, um, whether that's contract related or because he's basically being held out of work, according to Mike McDaniel, who knows what the truth is. Um, Tyreek did not participate in last year's offseason as well. Tyreek is 30. Tyreek doesn't need to be doing all this stuff. Um, you know how dynamic he is. Jalen Waddle did participate and made a, a number of decent, respectable plays primarily working with Tua Tonga-Valoa. He did bring in one very impressive catch. I think it was from Mike White, and it was over Kendall Fuller. Um, but let, let me get into who I would say were my top performers for the day. Um, for those who followed my work for years, you know that that's how I roll in terms of pop, top performers. Um, it's not coming up right now. Hold on one second. Um, I gave my top performer recognition to Devon A. Chan. Uh, dynamic, a uh, lot of check down, caught a lot of check down passes, wheel routes that he turned into get up field quickly and score, uh, beating beating defenders to the corner of, of the end zone. Um, obviously, you know, Devon A. Chan has the NFL's leader, is the NFL leader in yards per carry last season, uh, set a record, not a rookie record, set an NFL record. He's going to be a dynamic weapon in this offense as long as he continues to stay healthy. My second top performer would, would be Anthony Walker, the new addition at inside linebacker. Very solid. You've seen it, and I've seen it multiple days uh, going back to OTAs. Instinctive, tips balls at the line of scrimmage, jumps into passing lanes. I think that's the number one trait that I've seen from him. He jumps into passing lanes. Um, he got a lot of the starting reps because David Long was not really a heavy participant today. Um, he is very impressive to me uh, in terms of what I've seen from the linebacker unit, probably the top linebacker that has stood out to me so far. That's not saying anything about Jordan Brooks, but I've just noticed Anthony Walker a little bit more. And then my third performer is Saran Neal. Um, very surprised to see what his role is, um, primarily – uh, nickel, put him in the Nick Needham, Cater Kohu, nickel safety kind of role. Um, he had a number of, of, of decent plays defending the slot receivers. Um, I, I'm, I didn't know he's known as mostly a special teams guy, but you could definitely see he's got some nickel cornerback skills. Uh, and, and then I know I didn't include him in my top performers, but I felt like Tua Tongvaloa in the work that he's doing, which is primarily the nickel cornerback work. I mean, I'm sorry. Pri um, Tua is doing seven on sevens. He's not participating in any team drills. He's just exclusively doing seven on sevens. And it's quite interesting to see how this is basically turning into a hold-in. Tua has not participated in any of the 11 on 11 work that we've seen. He is, he's, he's really right now, um, 
kind of participating in a hold-in. And hey, that's his right. Right now, Tua is involved in a contract negotiations with the organization. And I guess until he gets his multi-year deal done and isn't, isn't forced to play on a fifth-year option, you're not going to see Tua in 11-on-11s. Will that change the rest of this week? I don't know, but Tua basically hinted that that's not going to change until his contract situation changes. Now, whether that will carry over the training camp, who knows? But in the seven-on-seven seven work that he was doing, Tua was dealing. I believe there were three passes that were not completions. Two of them were drops, one by Braylon Sanders, another by Matthew Sexton. And then he had a pass broken up by, I believe, Surah Neal. Um, not a thousand percent sure, but you can find all of those works and, and that daily recap in the Miami Herald. I'm going to do a daily camp observation, which gives you a, a, a snap synopsis of what happened during practice. But here's what happened after practice. Tua Tonga Valoa spoke for the second time this offseason and basically acknowledged that he's a little bothered, not frustrated, but bothered by the fact that a deal hasn't gotten done. He's not worried about a multi-year extension being done by training camp. Um, however, he didn't necessarily sound like he was optimistic, He, but he does feel like a deal will get done. However, when asked about the nature of the contract negotiations, he said the Dolphins have come a long way. So it seems like the initial offer was quite disrespectful. And he reiterated three times, the market is the market. Here's to it. In his own words. How concerned are you with your contract situation? And have you observed other quarterbacks around the league as they've gotten paid? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm not blind to to people that you know are in my position that are getting paid. Um, am I concerned about it? I'm not concerned about it, but there's a lot of uh, discussion, you know, that we've we've had that, um, you know, we just are trying to move that thing into the right direction where we can both be happy. So, are you, are you involved in it personally? Does it, your agent update you like every time there are talks? Well, my my agent updates me, but for me, I don't like updates like every time. Like, you don't got to tell me the little things. Just tell me things that, that matter. Are we getting to where we want to or are we not? That's it. Did you think there'd be more progress at this point? Any, any well, I think there's been a lot of progress at this point. Uh, from where we started, there's been a lot of progress. Now, you know, you can ask the other question, then why aren't we seeing, you know, an agreement? Well, that's the tough part about it. That's why it's, it's business. That's why you got one side and the other trying to work to, to meet in the middle. Are you confident that you'll get a deal? The contract negotiation have to do with your attendance during uh, the first part of offseason program? Uh, I, that I don't know. I don't control any of that. I control if I come or not, but I don't, I don't control, you know, how they think about that. Do you view those numbers that others get around the league as benchmarks for your negotiations like Jared Goff getting 53 for you? Well, I'll tell you one thing. The market is the market. If we didn't have a market, then none of that would matter. It'd just be an organizational uh, thing, you know? didn't matter if that guy got paid that because it's up to the organization. So that's what I would say. The market is the market. That's it. Are you confident that a deal will get done before training camp? Uh, I'm confident that a deal will get done. Um, but then again, it's not in my control. Um, you know, it's it's really up to both sides meeting in the middle with this. You're a passionate and emotional guy. Is it difficult for you to separate the two things out there? You know, to know yeah, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. For people that that talk about business is different than personal, sure, like I can agree to some extent. But who you are as a person, for what you do, business and personal, is who you are with how you do everything. That's how I see it. That's how, that's just how I look at it. And if not, like if you can be two different people at once, like, hey, by all means, you can do that. But to me, that's just not how I am. You know, I think the most important points from that conversation, uh, and that was only half of the conversation, uh, was where he talked about business and personal. Because for four years, this organization has talked about how they love Tua, how they're committed to Tua, how they believe in Tua. However, when it comes to the contract negotiations, they have not been close to what Tua's peers are making, which is the important, the market is the market comment. Now, we've discussed this 
endlessly all off season in regards to what's a fair deal for Tua. Um, Tua's not necessarily looking for fair. Tua is looking for the market price. And if you pay attention to what the market has done in the NFL, right now you've got Joe Burrow, Jared Goff, Patrick Mahomes, Justin Herbert, Lamar Jackson, Jalen Ramsey, they're all in average per year making over $50 million. Um, now, is the average per year a great indicator? I preach and tell everybody, no, it's not. The guaranteed money is a great indicator, and you have to look at the fine print of these deals to figure out what's the real money that these players are going to be making. And I've gone back and forth with you folks oh, you know, all offseason to tell you what the real money these, these quarterbacks are making. Um, I don't think it matters because everybody just pays attention to the guaranteed money. Justin Herbert on his seven-year $300 million deal, his real money over the first five years of the deal is $38.7 million. The first four years of the deal, his real money is 44.5. And when I say real money, I mean what will make it into their paycheck. Over the full five years of his deal, in terms of real money, Justin Herbert is going to be making over the seven years of his deal. He's going in his paycheck. He's going to be making forty two million dollars. Now, I only evaluate contracts based on their real money. You can have the average per year bull crap or talk about the extensions as much as you want. I only care what goes into a player's paycheck. Now, I personally think that Tua should clear in real money forty two million dollars. If Justin Herbert makes forty two million dollars, there's no reason why Tua shouldn't make forty two million dollars. Now, in terms of the guaranteed money, I look at it as 170 is fair. For if if Jared Goff got $170 million, Tua should reasonably make $170 million. If you just factor in his fifth year option at $23.1 million, and then the franchise tag for next year, which is at $42.1 million, that's $65 million, $65.2 million in money that you're already going to be paying Tua. Now you throw in another $45 million a year for the next two years, which brings you to 90. That, that contract is looking clearly at $55 million for over the next four years of the deal. So if we're at $155 million over the next four years of the deal, we can haggle back and forth, but that's the baseline of what Tua should be expecting. Um, but obviously this is going to be a very interesting contract negotiation I think it's going to take it all the way up to the exhibition season. I think there's a possibility based on Tua's actions right now. You might not see him participating in 11 on 11 work during all, during training camp until the deal gets done. If you remember Christian Wilkins' situation, Christian Wilkins participated in the first two weeks of training camp, took one single snap of team drills during a joint practice against the Atlanta Falcons and then shut it down for the entire training camp and exhibition season while they continue to negotiate a contract for the next four weeks. When a deal didn't get done, then he returned to practice. This is the new era of the NFL hold-ins because based on the new CBA contract that the players signed with the, with, 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 with the NFL owners, you can no longer hold out. If you hold out, you're subjected to fines that are ridiculous. Can't remember what the full total of the fines are, but by the time you get to the regular season, you'll be playing for free. Um, they're that substantial. Um, so what players have done from the Xavier Howards to the Christian Wilkins, they have been holding in, which means technically based on the NBA, based on the NFL language, you can show up for work. As long as you show up for work in the 10 team meetings and stand there and practice, you are a participant and an attendant. You do not, have, do not have to participate. That's what Xavier Howard did for a couple of a couple of weeks with the Dolphins organization, probably two off seasons. Tua can show up, participate in individual, participate in seven on seven, never set foot during 11 on 11s. And he can make a public stance that, hey, I'm pushing for a multi-year contract. And until I get one, this is this is how things are going to go. Um but Tua isn't the only player, Dolphins player, who is advocating, lobbying, petitioning for his contract to be readjusted. We also have Tyreek Hill. Now, the interesting part about Tyreek Hill's situation is the Dolphins had multiple opportunities 
to extend Tyreek's contract, and it probably would have been better to do it then as opposed to now because of all the new deals, the, 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 the Browns, um, the Justin Jeffersons that have gotten done, that have drastically raised what Tyreek once was the number two highest paid receiver in the NFL. Um, in fact, uh, and you can argue Devontae Adams, you could argue Cooper Cuff based on, you know, fake contract money. Um, but he has since been leapfrogged by a number of receivers from Justin Jefferson's to, um, to Calvin Ridley. But here's the thing. When you calculate only the real money that these wide receivers are going to make. And I, I, I don't factor in fake money because if you listen to the fake money, Jalen Waddle is going to be making $28 million a year. That's not true. Jalen Waddle has a five-year deal for $105 million and Jalen Waddle will be averaging $20.9 million over the duration of those five years. And truthfully speaking, only three years of that contract, three and a half are real. Now, well, does Jalen Waddle see every dollar of that, that new $105 million contract? I think he will. But if you extract the fake numbers, Jalen Waddle is the ninth highest paid receiver in the league at $20.9 million. Now, Tyreek just got passed up by Justin Jefferson, who signed a new contract with the Minnesota Vikings. He's going to be making $28.4 million a year for the next four years. I'm not sure he's going to get to that 50 of that contract. Devontae Adams is making $28.2 million a year. But truthfully speaking, only the final two years, the final two years of that contract is not real, will not be honored. This is either his last season with the Raiders, he's going to be traded, or he's going to be revisiting that contract. And when you take out the final two years of Devontae Adams' deal with the Raiders, he's really making $22.5 million a year. Cooper Cuff is the third highest paid receiver in the league. He's making a legit $24.4 million a year over the duration of his contract. And I believe this is his last year, and he's going to see every single penny of that contract. And then you got Tyreek Hill, who makes $24 million a year over the duration of his tenure with Miami. Tyreek on the books are is making 40, I mean, is making $30 million a year average, but that's because he's got a ridiculous $45 million salary in 2025 that balloons his average from 24 to $30 million. Tyreek will never see that 2025 contract. And the Dolphins know that. His agent knows that, which is why there's a push right now to have Tyreek's contract revisited. Now, here's the interesting part. The Dolphins could have easily revisited Tyreek's contract and created themselves 12 to $14 million in cap space by readjusting his salary, giving him a raise, adding two more years to the deal, giving him more guaranteed money. But they chose not to do that. Now, whether or not they chose not to do that because Tyreek's camp wasn't being reasonable or because Tyreek has had too many off-field incidents and you don't know about Tyreek in the locker room and Tyreek's character could be perceived as questionable, I don't know what the reality is. But Drew Rosenhaus's agent has basically said, hey, Dolphins organization knows where we stand. Tyreek flat out today said, I'm not comfortable not being a top five highest paid receiver in the league. And here's Tyreek in his own words. Uh, ensuring I'm a Dolphin for life. That's number one, man. That's priority number one, man. Um, but this is obviously the best situation for myself and, the, and my and, and, and the family. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it could get any better. You know, um, whether it's, you know, um, just to live in the establishment, the state, the taxes, it just everything, the weather, just it just everything that comes with just living in Miami is just beautiful man so we love it um and it's awesome man just to be here you know coaches are a wonderful teammates are wonderful man and I'm like 20 minute fight from the Bahamas so I can just go mm -hmm. to Bahamar anytime I want to man and do what I gotta do Jeremy, regarding your status in the league we know you're obviously one of the top receivers do you think you should always be paid like that should always be maybe a top five paid receiver Oh yeah, for sure. That, that's that's how like I, I feel like people should. Um, I, I feel like at the end of the day, if if you feel like you top five or something, that's like if you work at Amazon. If you like one of the best Amazon delivery drivers, you gonna feel like you gonna feel some. You, you gonna feel a certain type of way. You gonna go to your boss and say, "Hey, bro, I'm doing a hundred routes, and this person only doing sixty five routes. I supposed to be the top paid person. You feel me? 
So if you feel like you deserve something, go get it. You feel me? What, how do you feel about Tua's situation in terms of the fact that the contract still hasn't gotten done for him? Tua should have been paid. I've been saying this all offseason, man. And I know we got a great, you know, front office with uh, Greer and Shore. Um, and they're going to they gonna get it done. You know, um, obviously, a lot of people are um, comparing the Jared Goff situation um, and stuff like that. But, I mean, I feel like Tua is supposed to be up there w w with some of them guys and past some of them guys, man, because – just understanding his story and just the progression of how he's getting better each and every year and how he's carrying this offense, um, it's crazy. So he's going to continue to get better because I feel like when, when you get a new contract, they they're not paying you for uh, what you did. They paying you like it's almost like a it's almost like an investment. You feel me? It's not. Yeah, it's almost like an investment of what you're going to do in the future. So he's continually getting better. He's gradually getting better each and every year. Last year was Pro Bowl. This year going to be a payoff win and. I much more. So, two should have been paid. Yeah, that's Tyreek Hill talking about his contract situation. He wants to be paid like he's the top Amazon driver. Uh, and and Tyreek is without a doubt the unquestionable top weapon in the NFL. You can name whoever you'd like: Devontae Adams, Cooper Cuff, um, Justin Jefferson, Chase, uh, Chase uh, Jamar Chase. Uh, who's put up numbers like Tyreek? Who's done? two straight seasons of 1,700 yards. And the, really the only reason he didn't get to 2,000 yards is because uh, he got injured at the end of both the seasons. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where this goes. Uh, the one thing that I would like to point out regarding Tyreek Hill and Tua Tungavaloa's situation is if you factor in what their cap numbers are going to be for next year, if you do not get a revised contract for both done, um, it's going to be very difficult for you to do business in the NFL because if you look at where their contract situations are, um, Tyreek is on the books for $34 million in cap number in 2025. And Tua, if he's franchise tagged, will be on the books for $42 million. If you revisit both of their contracts, restructure both of their contracts, add more years to their years, they will be on the books for a portion of that $76 million. When I say a portion, I mean maybe 20. So you have the potential to clear a ridiculous amount of cap space by adjusting both of their contracts. Now, that's going to be quite expensive for Mr. Owner Steve Ross, but Ross has shown you he spares no expenses in, ter in terms of taking care of uh, this organization, in terms of playing their players. The question is, can Chris Greer get a deal done? And it'll be interesting to see as we continue to monitor these things up until training camp and up until the exhibition season and right up until the regular season. I'm not sure that a, that we couldn't be waiting a week before the season's opener um, to see these two players get compensated for for their for for their work, the work that they've done with the organization so far. On that note, uh, wanted to just give you a preview. We'll be trying to do one of these. Dolphins in-depth wrap-ups every single day that we have practice. We got practice Wednesday. We got practice Thursday. So hopefully you'll come back for this one-on-one -on -one breakdown and wrap-up of what happened in Dolphins land. On that note, see you tomorrow.